We've got Dr. John Latoski in studio for Dr. or Doc Talk Tuesday, and he brought a special friend along with Dr. Bustos, who is an ophthalmologist. And uh, we gave the number out right away, and right out of the gates, Dr. John, we want to talk about tonsils. Carol's got a question for you. Good morning, Carol. Good morning. Why are tonsils not coming out as children? Oh, yeah, that's a, actually a great question. You know, back... Um, uh, even though this doesn't have to do with eyes or vision, uh, tonsils are, uh, uh, you know, an important part of our immune system. They're actually big lymph nodes that sit in the back of our throat. And um, oftentimes uh, we do get infections and they become inflamed. And back in the 50s, we thought, you know, that's just abnormal. Let's just take everybody's tonsils out. And then we realized, you know, they really do serve a function. And you don't need to do all of these unnecessary surgeries. And so now what we found out with very strict criteria on uh, who should have their tonsils removed and who shouldn't, most people can leave them in. And actually, they're probably healthier for it. So um, it's just uh, it, it's how, uh, how we, we learn in medicine, uh, sometimes the hard way. Are they finding that more and more have to come out as adults when it's harder? You know, uh, actually not, uh, because usually, as um, you know, when we're when we're kids, tonsils are huge because they're they're just overactive. Uh, kids are being exposed to uh, viral pathogens all the time, and our tonsils react to that. As we get older, our tonsils actually shrink in most cases. And um, and I would say that in in children, the major reason to have tonsils and adenoids removed is because of repetitive strep infections. In adults, it's probably because the tonsils don't shrink and they cause things like snoring or sleep apnea. Do you still have your tonsils? No. Oh, well. I had them out when I was 15, and it was a miserable experience. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the question, the thing that I can't tell you is, uh, were your tonsils inappropriately taken out, or should they have come out? And uh, and there's actually very uh, very good criteria that we have now that our pediatricians follow that. So uh, okay, you'll do just fine without them. All right, Carol, <laughs> thank you so much for the call. We appreciate it. Five four one six eight six zero five nine zero. So as we discussed, we have uh, Daniel Bustos uh, here in the uh, in the office, ophthalmologist with Peace Health Medical Group. His office is um, over at the University District Hospital campus, uh, twelve hundred Hilliard. He's on the uh, the first floor. Um, with uh, optical shop right next door, and uh, good morning. Good morning. Oh, there we go. Now we can... one more time. Good morning. There he is. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, um, just to let everybody know uh, today, any questions that you have about eyes or vision, um, go ahead and give us a call five four one six eight six zero five ninety. And um, next week, uh, store up your questions or uh, Facebook them to us at uh, facebook dot com uh, peace health. Uh, we're going to be talking about joints and joint disorders, and we will have uh, Bethany Amin, who is the manager of the new Joint Replacement Center, uh, and that will be next week. So we'll talk about uh, about joints next week. This week, uh, we're talking about vision and eyes, and actually, uh, right out of the shoot, we got an, an email question from Stephanie. You ready? Ready. Uh, Stephanie is uh, uh, less than 30 years of age, and she says, I often have floaters and flashes in my left eye. These are sometimes associated with a migraine, but at times I will get the visual changes without the onset of a migraine. Are these episodes a cause for concern? What causes the visual changes, and could they be caused by something other than my migraines? That's a great question. I think the first thing to sort out is that you can have flashes and floaters from a couple of different things. Migraines is one of the most common ones, but also having some uh, changes inside the eye and resulting in some traction on the retina can also cause these flashes and floaters. So I think the first thing to know is whether this is happening in just one eye or not, or whether it's happening in both. When you have the uh, psychedelic... uh, type, what people describe as psychedelic type of flashes from a migraine, it doesn't matter whether you cover one eye or whether you have both eyes open, you're still going to see the same process. Uh, If you have flashes and floaters related to something going on inside the eye as opposed to in the brain that migraines are in, uh, then you can cover the eye that you think this is happening in and you shouldn't see those symptoms anymore. You should see them a lot less. So if she has this normal migraine flashes and floaters that seem to go along with her normal process of migraines, I don't think that's something she needs to get worked up about as long as she's following up with her doctor about it. But if these are new symptoms that she notices with just one eye only, then it's something she should see her ophthalmologist about. What are floaters? 
Photos are little specks, little dots that you might see in your vision, especially when you're looking at a, at a high contrast area like the bright sky or a computer screen. And they can come in any any different uh, shape. Some people describe theirs as a donut. Some people have little spots and dots. Some people say, I have a screen that floats in front of my vision. Uh, so that can be related to something going on inside the eye or something going on inside the brain, like a migraine. Okay. And And so floaters are normal? Floaters, for the most part, are relatively normal. Uh, there is a, a body of jelly that occupies most of the volume in the back of the eye. It's called vitreous. And when we're born, this vitreous is pretty thick. It's like a jello jiggler. It's pretty thick. And as we get older, this jelly liquefies and starts to collapse and pull in on itself. And as it does that, parts of the jelly that are attached to the retina seem to pull away and little pieces of them could float inside the rest of the jelly, and we see that as a floater. And so the only way, really, to avoid that is just to not live. So it's pretty normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously, you know, there there are some uh, there are some changes that people can get in their vision that they certainly should be seeing uh, an eye specialist. Absolutely, yeah. And but um, what about people who say, you know, I have no problems with my vision that I know of? How how often should folks be getting an eye exam? Well, that's a great question. When you're talking about, let's say you're talking about your child, uh, your child goes through regular screenings with their pediatrician and also a vision screenings in their school. And so uh, as, as an ophthalmologist, I find that those are pretty adequate to take care of most uh, vision problems that will roll through their, uh, through their practices. Uh, if, let's talk about a healthy adult. If you are between the ages of 20 and 60, I think as long as you're not having any problems with your vision and uh, all your needs are met, I think having one good, thorough, dilated eye exam between that time is sufficient because that's enough to catch any major risk factors that you have for diseases. After the age of 60, it's a whole different ballgame because at that point, then your risk of uh, chronic eye diseases like macular degeneration and glaucoma all rise dramatically. So after the age of 60, you really should be having a good, thorough, dilated eye exam every one to two years. Okay, what about that? You turn 40 and you're going to need readers. Everybody told me that, and it was the case, actually. I think 41, I started uh, doing the reader thing. And now I'm noticing that um, I've gotten a little bit stronger with the readers, and I notice now that in the morning and in the evening, um, my eyes are blurry even with the readers, just a little bit. Is that because of tired eyes, or is that because I need to go in and, and see about a little stronger reader? You know, it could be due to both. Uh, I think what you can find is that what you can rely on generally is that between the ages of 45 and 65, about every five years, you're probably going to need a bump up in the strength of reading glasses. It's possible that the demands of your vision during the day are such that you need something stronger. Maybe you're using a two week of a of an over-the-counter reading glass for what you need. So it's okay to go out and try a stronger strength. It's not going to hurt your eyes to do that. But certainly, even if you're using the right strength, if you're using your eyes all day long in heavy, visually intensive activities such as computer work or, or reading or, or driving, then that can be signs of eye strain as well. So they, they can both seem like that. And speaking of eye exams, maybe this is a dumb question, doctor, but what exactly do the numbers mean 2020, 2010, 2040? Not a dumb question at all. I think most people intuitively realize that 2020 is fairly normal vision, but most people don't know why. Let's let's take, for example, uh, let's say that I have 20-40 vision and Grant, you have 20-20 vision. What that means is you can see at 40 feet what I can only see at 20 feet. So it's a comparison, really. It's a just all it is is a straight comparison. Uh, over in the UK, they measure things in meters. So, uh, you know, six over 12. Uh, you know, so we, it's just a comparison sake. So 2020, we consider normal vision in the state of Oregon. You have to have one eye that sees 2040 or better to be able to drive legally without glasses. So it's all relative. All right. Back to the prescription and reader glasses for a second. What, how do you know when you need to jump from readers to a prescription? Well, I think the best way to know is if you are having visual symptoms away from the target area that you're designing your reading glasses to see. So if you're using your reading glasses for uh, work on your desk uh, and you notice that when you look out the window, you look down the hallway in your office, you're still not seeing things clearly, that's when it's time to go get evaluated and to see whether you need some distance vision glasses. All right. Very good. So um, just, uh, just as a, a recap here, when um, I, I get my uh, reading glasses at the drugstore and I put on a couple of different strengths and decide which one fits best for 
where I hold my reading material. That's completely safe to do. Oh, perfect. All reading glasses are a magnification. So it's not going to hurt you to wear something that's the wrong magnification for you. It may give you a headache, but it won't hurt your eyes. So that's what I counsel my patients to do all the time is go take whatever you're going to read, go to the drugstore, put on whatever makes it clear where you like to hold things, and boom, you've got what you need. 6860590, that is the number to call and ask Dr. Booth Stost or Dr. John a question about eyes. Good morning, Betty. Good morning. I have a question. Um, I'm uh, fine. I'm 80 years old now, and my eyes are still really well, well, uh, serve me well. But my comment to you when you're talking about floaters, I find I'm basically vegetarian, and when I eat anything with meat in it, very much meat, my, I start seeing floaters. Is there a connection? Good morning, Bay. That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, off the top of my head, I really can't font, think of a, of a diehard and true connection between eating meat and floaters. Perhaps what you're noticing is that uh, chewing more vigorously kind of stirs up the floaters that you have in your eye, and you're noticing that because they're being stirred up. It's, uh, floaters are not unlike uh, a snow globe, and so when you shake the snow globe a little bit, you tend to notice the things, the snow floating a little bit more. And so I suspect that's what you're experiencing, but otherwise I don't know of any connection in between the two. I just thought maybe it was uh, uh, the meat proteins that were creating the problem. So, okay, well, thank you so much. Certainly, but better. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Uh, a snow globe. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pretty apt comparison, actually. So, you know, we uh, we were talking about uh, about glasses and about readers. And, and of course, one of the things that uh, you see advertised uh, quite a bit, not as much as you used to, but uh, this, this procedure called LASIK. And uh, with all of us uh, folks wearing glasses, how come everybody doesn't go out and get LASIK? That's a great question. Well, number one, just practically, it's expensive. It's a cosmetic procedure and not covered by most medical insurances. And so it really does cost a few thousand dollars to invest in. So it's quite an investment. Uh, and, and there are many people that just don't have that capability. Uh, but I think also why you don't see a lot of people having LASIK are because uh, some people uh, find that it's not worth the risk of having surgery on your eyes just to have some convenience or to, to indulge vanity maybe. Some people have uh, LASIK for very different reasons. Some pilots need LASIK because of their jobs. But uh, for a lot of us, it's just a convenience. We don't want to wear glasses. Hmm. And, and how great is the risk? Well, you know, LASIK is a very, generally it's a very safe procedure, and many people do very, very well. Uh, but the risks are still there. It's still a major surgery. Uh, even though most people do very well, there are risks that you could end up as, as poorly as you see now with glasses, as poorly as you see without mm. glasses, or somewhere in between. So there's not a guarantee that having LASIK means you're going to walk out seeing like Superman. Uh, while many people will carry that story out with them after LASIK, uh, I see not a few people who maybe not have maybe have not had catastrophic results, but have not had the happiness or the zing factor that they wanted and have regretted doing it, spending the money, putting their eyes at risk when they didn't get what they wanted. And so it's not for everybody. All mm -hmm. right. It's a Doc Talk Tuesday. We've got Dr. John in studio. Dr. Daniel Bustos is our guest this morning, an ophthalmologist. Stoy called in, and he's driving and does not have a Bluetooth, so he's going to do it safely, but he would love to uh, have you talk about he He works on the computer a lot. And two to three minutes working on the computer, he feels car sick. Why is that? Well, that's interesting. Uh, when someone tells me that they feel car sick, you know, one of the most common things is that they have an unmet refractive error. Uh, so they're, they're looking through or focusing through a need for glasses that's being unmet. Uh, and specifically when someone says, I feel car sick, oftentimes it, there is a difference in the need for glasses between the two eyes. And the brain is trying to reconcile the images coming from each eye at the same time. And it makes somebody car sick. Uh, and somebody who's had cataract surgery in one eye and not the other, their eyes are imbalanced. Their refractive air is imbalanced. And they feel that car sickness characteristically. So that's possible. That's what he's experiencing. Okay. We're in the middle of a Doc Talk Tuesday. Dr. John, when we come back, more questions. More eye stuff. There we go. More eye stuff with Dr. Daniel Bustos, 541-686-0590. We might even try to uh, debunk a few of those eye myths out there. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. All right. We were uh, talking a little bit about some of the myths that we have about our uh, eyes and vision. Grant, you had a... Well, I don't a know if it's one. a myth or not, but I am curious. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is watching a movie in the dark. Mom and Dad would always say, turn that light on, you're going to ruin your eyes. Is that true? Uh, I hate to say, Mom and Dad, no, it's not true. <laughs> well, it may give you a headache. Uh, it may annoy your parents to do it, but uh, 
it really doesn't damage your eyes. Uh, the eyes are naturally looking for more light. Your pupils will dilate, and you're going to adjust for the most part to what lighting situation you have. So not terribly, no. What hmm. about on that same subject? You're sitting too close to the TV. You're going to hurt your eyes. Again, sorry, mom and dad. Uh, that one's a myth, too. Uh, the TV is not going to fry your eyes or, or, or make your vision worse or cause you to need more glasses. Uh, I, I actually have a, uh, an aunt who's a physicist, and uh, she's a pretty prominent physicist, and she used to try and convince me of the same thing. Uh, unfortunately, she's passed away for many years since before I became an ophthalmologist, but I've since wanted to tell her, not so much, you know. It doesn't really damage your eyes. Now, I don't even want to ask this next question, Grant, about the computer <laughs> screen. I think I know my answer already. The computer screen, is that going to hurt your eyes if you sit in front of it too long? Uh, same thing as the TV. Uh, it's not going to cause any permanent damage. Uh, about one of the most common things that people complain about, though, is in sitting in front of the computer screen too long is that their eyes just feel tired. They feel irritated. And just because we're using our eyes a lot, that's partially part of their symptoms. But no, it's not going to cause any permanent damage. Okay, what about reading in the dark? Same thing. Oh, we it's going to it may cause us a headache. It may cause us to read a little slower, um, be more frustrated. But in the end, it's not going to cause our eyes any oh. damage. Oh, my kids are so happy right now listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll thank you for them. <laughs> so, um, of course, we've we've all heard growing up that um, carrots, of course, help your vision. Oh, that's a great one. Carrots are wonderful. I'm always pushing carrots on my kids. But not for the reason you think. Uh, you know, the carrots have um, vitamin A in them, and vitamin A is crucial in retinal photoreceptor regeneration. It's crucial in making those rods and cones that we are, our retinas use to interpret the light that we see. However, uh, just about anyone that lives in a developed country is getting enough vitamin A in a regular diet that getting excess vitamin A from eating more carrots doesn't really help their vision any better. It doesn't make their eyes any more healthy. It doesn't make their vision any better. It really only helps the person who has a severely vitamin A deficient diet. Some uh, Maybe an old lady eating tea and crackers all day long and that's all she eats or somebody in a less developed country. But it's not going to make our eyes any better to eat more carrots, unfortunately. So if you don't like carrots, you won't go night blind? For the most part, no. <laughs> okay. Good. okay. All right, back to the blurry vision. While you're driving, Dr. Bustos, what happens when the signs ahead are somewhat blurry? Are those readers, or does that mean you need to come and uh, get an eye exam and go for prescription? That's a great question. I think the answer to that really lies in in the, in the how long your symptoms are happening. If it's all the time when you're driving, you notice as soon as you start driving, you can't see very well in the distance and nothing ever comes clear, even after a few blinks or taking a break while you're driving, then that's an indication that, yeah, you may need some uh, prescription glasses for distance vision. But if it's only happening, say, after you've been on the road for an hour and you, you blink a few times and that gets, gets a little bit better, that's unlikely to, to be a glasses need solely, but more likely that your eyes are just a little tired and maybe even dry from being open for so long. Now, on that note, we were talking off the air about dry eyes, and you were saying maybe in the morning and in the evening when the vision is a little bit uh, more blurry and uh, that liquid tears might be a, an option. Can you talk about liquid tears a little bit? Absolutely. So dry eyes, there's a there's a whole uh, spectrum of of problems with the eyes that can lead to a dry eye syndrome, or some people call it a dysfunctional tear film syndrome. Uh, if you think of the eye like a camera, two-thirds of the focusing power of the eye lies at the interface between the air and the layer of tears on the front of your eye. And so because two-thirds of your focusing power lies there, anything that disturbs that layer of tears is going to mess with your vision. And so uh, the baseline treatment for any kind of dry eye syndrome or dry eye problem is, use, is the use of artificial tears or some lubrication. And that, by and large, fixes a lot of people's problems just by using artificial tears two to three times a day. What about just splashing your face with water? Oh, it, I think most people will say that it makes their eyes feel good and mm -hmm. kind of momentarily helps. Uh, but the same uh, the same thing goes for just using artificial tear every now and then. If you just put one here and put one in there, it really doesn't do a lot of good. Okay. It may make your eyes feel better at the moment, but do you really get the benefit from using artificial tears and lubricating your eyes? It really has to happen consistently two to three times a day, every day, for at least a few two to three weeks before you really start noticing a benefit from it. All right, 541-686-0590, the number to call if you've got any questions regarding your eyes, eyesight, um, eye surgery, LASIK surgery, whatever you have. Dr. Busto's in studio with us, and Dr. John Latosky in for Doc Talk. So when uh, in primary care medicine, uh, one, one very common thing that we see are uh, folks coming in with the red eye, itchy, uh, irritated. This time of year, it may be viral pink eye. 
Um, in a couple of months, it'll probably, at least some of those cases will be allergy related eye symptoms. Um, how, how do you tell the difference between infection, allergy? That's a great question. One of the, two, those two things you mentioned are two of the most common th- reasons why I see a red eye in my clinic. About almost half and half right now are allergies and viruses. Uh, for the most part, you can make a, a decent determination based on symptoms. The virus that causes a pink eye, and pink eye really is a viral conjunctivitis. The virus that causes that is the same virus that can cause the common cold or, or a common stomach flu. Uh, and so if you've had or been around anyone with a virus, uh, upper respiratory infection or a stomach flu, and then you come down with a red eye and otherwise is not all that otherwise bothersome, that's a good indicator that maybe this is a viral infection. On the flip side, if your eye is pink or red, and more often it's involving both rather than just one, and you have itching, oftentimes intense itching, that's a big indicator. This is probably allergies versus an infection. And so a lot of those folks with pink eye will come in um, thinking they really need an antibiotic eye drop. And, you know, there have been some cases where I have looked at their eyes and heard their symptoms and said, hmm, this probably is viral, but I cannot exclude a bacterial infection. Uh, any uh, any help here? Uh, that, that's a great scenario. It, I, I see it all the time, and I think uh, it's a very uh, it's a very uh, good, uh, well centered, well meaning thing to want to treat for a bacterial infection because we know that those can do sometimes more damage than just having a generalized viral conjunctivitis. And so, by and large, I don't think a great deal of damage is is done by giving antibiotics. But on the flip side, we tend to uh, create more bacterial resistance by just throwing antibiotics on things that, for the most part, usually aren't bacterial. Uh, and it it tends to uh, actually spread a viral conjunctivitis even more. So let's take the example of a two-year-old who goes to preschool, and they come in with a viral conjunctivitis and are given antibiotics and told, take these for a day. And after a day of taking these, you won't be infectious anymore. You can go back to preschool. Well, what happens is that a virus is still there. The, the antibiotics, because they treat only bacteria, do nothing for that virus. So the virus is still there, still being shed in the tears. And then that virus gets spread through that preschool or through the workplace. Uh, and it tends to um, cause bacterial resistance, but it tends to make people lower their, lower their guard in keeping their uh, hygiene at an utmost level. Wow. That's, yeah. So, uh, you know, a, a very important point, and we see this all the time with uh, all types of respiratory infections. A lot of them are viral. Antibacterial antibiotics only work against bacteria. Uh, they have no effect on viruses whatsoever. And uh, probably, you know, just like we've seen in a lot of different scenarios, we're inappropriately treating viral infections with antibiotics, and it does uh, lead to resistance. And Probably one of the best things that we can do is, uh, well, cover those costs and wash your hands. <laughs> yeah, tr- tried and true measures. I mean, infection control, uh, you know, maybe keeping your child home for a day or two or until you can get to the doctor and find out what's really going on. We're going to head to the phone line, 686-0590. Welcome in, Dan. Good morning, Dan. Uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, doctor, um, uh, are you familiar with uh, retina surgery? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, whenever you have retina surgery, uh, do you um, uh, have to uh, cut any muscles to uh, uh, to, to apply a, a buckle? Uh, for the most part, muscles that move the eye uh, are, are not usually cut to place a buckle. The buckle can be threaded uh, around the muscles. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a pretty rare occasion that I think a muscle is moved or transposed or cut to put a buckle. I see. How about if you if you run a, uh, up against uh, scar tissue, could that have an effect on it? Certainly so. So for the listening for the listening viewers, a buckle may be placed around the eye, and for somebody who has a problem with the retina, such as a retinal attachment, and that buckle can decrease the tractional forces on the retina and help the retina to heal. Uh, when a buckle is placed, it's placed around the circumference of the eye and threaded between the muscles that move the eye. And yes, if there is scar tissue, uh, that can prevent the buckle from being placed or, or can dislodge or move the buckle such that it's not optimally placed. So you're absolutely right. That can be an issue. Okay. So uh, just to kind of understand what you're saying, if you, uh, if you do have scar tissue and a buckle is going to be applied, uh, depending on the amount of scar tissue, 
would determine where a muscle would have to be cut. Is that correct? Well, not quite. Uh, again, usually muscles aren't cut to put a buckle. If there's scar tissue, sometimes that scar tissue can be debrided a bit to allow the buckle to be placed properly. Uh, but it's pretty seldom to almost rare that a muscle is cut or moved to uh, accommodate a buckle, even, oh. even in the face of scar tissue. Okay, that, that answers my question. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan, for the call. All right, we're in the middle of a Doc Talk Tuesday. Any and all questions for Dr. John? And uh, we've got Dr. Daniel Bustos in studio with us as well. Any and all eye questions? We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with yours. 15 minutes left on a Doc Talk Tuesday here. 541-686-0590. Get your questions in. We are KUGN News Talk 590. It's Doc Talk on KUGN News Talk 590. News Talk 590, along with Dr. John Latoski in studio. We've got Dr. Daniel Bustos in studio talking about the eye. And we've got Millie on the line. She's got a question for you. Good morning, Millie. Your question? Hi, doctor. Um, my question is, I have been putting off uh, cataract surgery on my eye, especially my left eye needs it. Uh, it's been a couple of years now. <laughs> I keep putting it off. <clears throat> anyway, my question is, uh, is this harmful to my eye if I keep putting it off? Good morning, Millie. That's a great question. The short answer is no. The wonderful thing about cataract surgery is that it's semi-elective. All a cataract is is your lens that you were born with, which is now uh, cloudy and stiff and used to be clear and flexible. And so the only bad thing that leaving a cataract in your eye will cause is that your vision is just not quite as good. It causes symptoms and problems with your vision. But for the most part, leaving a cataract in uh, longer than some people would suggest is not going to hurt your eye at all. Okay, well, that's a relief, but it would make my um, eyesight a little bit better, right? <laughs> oh, I definitely think so. If someone told you you've, your, your eye is ready for cataract surgery, it's very likely that having that surgery is going to improve your quality of vision and also improve your life. All right. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure, Millie. Thanks for the call, Millie. All right, Dr. Daniel Bustos, I've got a question for you on kind of the heels of what Dr. John was talking about earlier. Is when you just wake up and there's a red dot in your eye and it just looks so painful. What is that from? It's a great question. It's a bruise, essentially. All it is is a broken blood vessel, and it can rage anywhere anywhere from the size of a, a dot, a red dot, to the whole white of the eye being just filled with blood, and it can look ghastly, and people think their eye is going to fall out, oh, and yeah. they're just running up and down the streets. It's a bruise, and it looks so much worse on the eye because the, the blood is seen through a transparent membrane called the conjunctiva. A bruise on your arm is seen through a, a thick layer of skin, so we don't see the blood quite as it is. It's more brown and purple, but we see the blood just as it is on the eye. It's a bruise. How does your eye get bruised? Uh, for the most part, it's through some kind of strain or pressure transmitted in the head or to the eye. Eye rubbing is a real common example. And oftentimes in our sleep, we really don't know what we do to our eyes. And so we've rubbed our eyes or we've hit our eye accidentally. And that's all it can take to cause a bruise like that. Okay. So I wanted to, uh, we were talking a little bit about cataracts. And uh, Millie was wondering, so is it going to, uh, I have a cataract and um, when I get surgery, is it going to improve my vision? Um and just a couple of thoughts came to my mind. My grandmother back in the 70s had cataract surgery, and um, there was a problem with the lens, and she ended up having to wear glasses that looked like they should be the lenses on the Hubble t telescope, you know. And uh, that was back in the 70s, and now uh, there's, you know, these bloodless, fast, universally uh, successful surgeries for cataract. It's really amazing how the medical technology has progressed in that field. Oh, just leaps and bounds. I, I hear uh, stories all the time uh, from some of my patients who say, oh, my father had it, my mother had it, and she was in the hospital for a week wearing sandbags on her eyes, and it took her two months to get her, her vision back, and, and now today people are coming in for surgery, uh, leaving an hour or two later, and the next morning they're seeing wonderfully. Yeah, so amazing. it's just developed leaps and bounds. Yeah, and you know, I've, uh, I, I've heard this story, I don't know, if it, uh, you've probably heard this as well. I don't know if it's true. The, the famous painter, uh, Claude Monet, when very early in his, I, th I think it's Monet, very early in his career, you'd look at his paintings and they're very crisp and there's lots of color. And then as he aged, you sort of got these washed out colors and things were kind of blurry. And it was, it was uh, supposed that he had cataracts. It, it, Am I, I saying this right? I, I have heard something to that effect. And I, th I think you're exactly right. And I think that's a common um, 
view or perception that people will tell me is that uh, when they get the first eye done and they have waiting to have the second eye done, they can compare it. I go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize my carpet wasn't this dirty. I've been trying uh, to clean right. it every yeah, yeah. day for the past two years. <laughs> it's not that dirty. So, um, you know, one other thing about eye surgery, we were uh, talking with a gentleman about uh, retinal detachment and this buckle. Buckle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, back uh, when I did a, when I was in medical school and I did a rotation in ophthalmology, they actually, for retinal detachment, would inject an air bubble into the eye and have people lay face down for it. Do they still do that? They still do that. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. All it's right. A- we got a fact or fiction Shoot. from Coop. He said when he was young, he tried to keep his eyes open while sneezing, and he couldn't. And his grandmother said, don't ever try to keep your eyes open while sneezing because your eyeballs will fall out. He goes, ask him that one. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I love that question because I tried to do the same thing when I was in fifth grade. I, I couldn't do it either. But I will say... Fiction. Uh, occasionally, I'll have someone who I'm operating on having cataract surgery done, and we have their eye propped open for the surgery, and they sneeze, and they cough, and their eye doesn't go anywhere, thankfully. But, no, it, it's a myth. <laughs> okay. A great one, though. Very good. 541-686-0590. We have a time for just a quick, quick question last minute, or we'll just take it out. You know, uh, I, I did want to talk briefly about uh, some really interesting uh, report that was in the news uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, stem cell. Well, first of all, um, macular degeneration and then uh, stem cell injections to help these folks that have macular degeneration. Can you talk a little bit about Wonderful technology. Yeah. There are some embryonic stem cell research going on at UCLA and also the Morris Hill Hospital in London where they're doing these trials where they will inject embryonic stem cells uh, in patients that have macular degeneration, both old and young patients with macular degeneration, and are testing the safety and the efficacy of doing this therapy to improve the vision. And very limited results so far. Uh, but on a few patients, they've been able to show that their vision increases by a few lines, uh, by a few letters of vision, which is not a great deal, but for someone who has debilitating vision loss, could mean the difference between getting out of a burning house or not. So amazing results, very early infancy as far as testing goes, but promising. Oh, good. Do you, do you think, uh, so they, uh, they've they noticed that, uh, I think there were two patients that um, may have had some improvement in vision. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you think it's real or, you know, we just, uh, uh, over the, the weekend, I was hearing these reports about uh, antidepressants and about how, you know, the placebo effect. And one of the uh, one of the things that they mentioned was a VA study on uh, knee arthroscopic surgery and how the sham surgery people would do just as well as people who had the r- real surgery. Is, is there a, a risk of uh, maybe this isn't? True. <laughs> Dr. John, I think that's a great question. And I think that is 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 a crux of what research does to help us answer that question. When you have two patients, you do run that risk of, of interpreting these results as you know, maybe this is a placebo effect. And that's why more and more research is needed and why larger scale studies are needed to have the numbers to be able to prove that yes, this is real, no, this is placebo. So I want to uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Bustos, and coming in and and answering all of our questions and and debunking our myths and telling us a few other tidbits about eyes and vision. Uh, Dr. Daniel Bustos is um, a Peace Health Medical Group ophthalmologist, and he and his group and the uh, optical shop next door are at 1200 Hilliard, which is at the University District uh, campus right there on the first floor. Yep, correct. Easy to find, easy to park. Um, We'd love it's to have been you. It's been great. Yeah. It has Thank been you. great. Thank you so much. You what a wealth of knowledge. Of and next week we'll be talking about joints and joint replacements. Uh, if you have any uh, questions you'd like to ask, certainly you can call us next uh, week at 541-686-0590. Or if you got a question and you don't, don't want to wait until then, please do uh, send it to us either uh, email or Facebook, uh, facebook.com backslash Peace Health Oregon. Uh, and I'll uh, get your question and read it on the air. All right. Dr. John, once again, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Dr. Bustos, Grant McHill, happy birthday to you. Have a fantastic rest of your day.